coming out of the industry at a young age, you end up having a very transactional outlook on interpersonal relationships. Um, you kind of are like, what am I getting from this? Or what do I have to do? How do I have to perform in order to extract what I need in this moment? Uh, and it, it, it really it really messes you up for a long time. Um, you know, you also have to live in your ego actively. It's, it's, I actually call it narcissistic purgatory in, I believe that article as well, um, because it's like, you, you don't want to talk about yourself, but you have to talk about yourself. You don't want to think about the past because you want to heal from the past, but you have to talk about the past because that's all people talk about. And so it's like you're, you're one foot in, one foot out, or one foot grabbing you from the grave. And you're like, what, what, what can I do? I cannot win. Um, so you feel extremely vulnerable and you feel extremely exposed and everywhere you go, you feel raw and you feel like you have to be another version of yourself because that better version of yourself is going to improve, uh, the quality of your life or, you know, you don't have any answers essentially because you, you really aren't given a point of view when you're a young kid and you're and, and they're, they're like this is the character you're going to play kind of dissociate um over time there's a lot of my childhood that I don't even remember um when I think about how I'm getting my kids to connect the dots in interpersonal relationships from step you know from now uh, it's not just gentle parenting it's me reparenting myself they have body awareness no means no and just that alone, that body awareness, keeps them in their body. If I ever know, if I ever see them get that thousand yard stare where they're dissociating because it's like an uncomfortable moment, I'm immediately like, okay, let's, let's try to take the time we can because this is obviously sending this kid to a point that they can't handle this. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a break. Hi, I'm Ryan Vialik. I'm Jonathan Cohen. And welcome to our breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. But today is one you probably would want to break down because I think everybody would like to hang out and talk to Christy Carlson Romano, but we're the ones who are going to do it. Now, Jonathan, you're Canadian. It's been established on the show. It's It's been established. You come from a very special, you know, universe of Canadian Disney people in your arena, Alanis Morissette being the one that comes to mind. But Christy Carlson Romano was very, very special to a lot of American Disney watchers and also people all over the world. Um, she's an Emmy-nominated actress. She's an entrepreneur, a content creator. She's a host. She has a podcast called Vulnerable. And she's best known for her roles in Disney's Kim Possible, even Stevens and Cadet Kelly. She was the first person, and I have to imagine maybe the last, to star in three Disney Channel projects simultaneously. Well, now it's a competition. <laughs> I want to star in three <laughs> Disney Channel shows simultaneously. Um, Christy's going to talk about her childhood really immersed in uh, really a, a very special era, you know, of Broadway. Um, and a lot of people know her from that as well. Um, Christy, like many of us, is fascinated with people being fascinated with nostalgia and the era that she was raised in, essentially, and, and I was as well. Um, very, very excited to talk to Christy Carlson Romano. Without further ado, Christy, welcome to The Breakdown. Break it down. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, it's very nice to have you here. I feel like we've met, like we've probably been at things together. I feel like that might have happened in our life. I hope so. I would have loved that. It would have been so nice to know you. Oh, I thought you were going to be like, oh my God, you don't remember we had a sleepover. Okay. <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I think we've all been really busy and part of acting at a young age kind of makes you like forget things. Like I kind of don't remember like the first decade of my life. So that's partly that. Well, that sounds fascinating. <laughs> Let's get into it. <laughs> Let's do it, please. And you're like, y'all are qualified. <laughs> yes, we are. Please. We are qualified to pick people apart. Um, 
you know, we've 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 had a lot of the same guests on our podcasts. We've had um we have. Yeah, we've had some really cool kind of crossover and um you know, and I think what what your podcast Vulnerable, you know, is able to do is literally kind of meet people exactly where they're at and you have people on who want to be vulnerable. And that's really it, it's really important and I think it's such a it's such an interesting intersection of our fascination with celebrity and our current sort of fascination with mental health and mental wellness. And I think your podcast is really kind of hitting that intersection. Before we get into sort of like your childhood and all of the awesome work you did when you were a kid, can you talk a bit about why why you wanted to start a podcast with literally the title Vulnerable? <laughs> I'm sorry. First of all, I'm smiling so big right now because I feel like I manifested this, but it took like years. I I am such a, a fan of you and everything you've done, even from your YouTube days. Um, I feel like you're one of us, right? Like there's a very, and John, you're amazing too. This is not to exclude you oh, from you. this entirety of the, the importance of all of this, but Mayim has been an inspiration to me ever since I was a kid. Um, so this is kind of very full circle and um, uh, I was an East coast brunette girl who loved to sing and Blossom was in my house nonstop. I can't even tell you the bucket hats <laughs> that we had with sunflowers on them. Girl, like <laughs> talk about nostalgia, but obviously what happens over time, uh, is, you know, as you're graduating through the different milestones of your career, uh, some of the, the, the cracks in the system kind of get bigger and bigger if they're not mended <laughs> uh, and glued and, you know, just fixed. So for me personally, I kind of stopped growing. And that was right around the time that I went to Barnard um, in originally in 02. It took me 12 years to finish. Um, but I kind of left LA and really didn't understand you know, Facebook just happened. And I had heard over a few years after Facebook, Twitter was a thing and certain new Disney stars that were like the next generation had really become big on Twitter, right? Um, Ashley Tisdale was one of those people. Mm. And she started having production company and like, sort of like the whole common uh, thread of women empowering themselves and having their own production companies became a thing. So it's ironic and shut me up if I'm talking too much to unpack all this. No, stuff to you. this is I'm um, I'm 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 digging it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. No. Really though. Shut me up. <laughs> um, I just feel like I'm, I I I I was typecasted as the smart older sister type, and um, so much of that was a character. And um, I was actually the youngest in an Italian family uh, that was a little violent and um, you know struggling middle class. Uh, and so for me, I had been casted in this very broad, iconic role model image, um, which I did not know how to understand and comprehend, um, and also how to grow past from that for a very, very long time. So enter into many, many years later, we've got COVID, um, prior to COVID I was doing, uh, just social media stuff that would give me like, you know, post stuff and get free baby stuff. Cause that shit's expensive. <laughs> that shit's expensive. And I was like, what am I going to do? How are we going to leave LA? You know, everything's on fire all the time. So, so I just started to dip my toe in the water of like getting free products and then eventually getting paid. But social media then became my like career, like my entry, my re-entry point into my career. And, um, and it was a really fascinating journey that I'd never would have thought, never would have thought this would have been my life. And so how did the podcast come about? So after YouTube, uh, I started doing lots of different types of YouTube, as I know from your YouTube, how different you do, you know, authentic content that's true to your life, the cooking content. <laughs> I remember I really wanted you to on my, one of my cooking shows and it's like, I, I love the community of YouTube. And I think YouTube's definitely changed since the early days. Uh, the num the clicks are way harder to get. There's so much of a, a science to even just the thumbnails uh, that you learn over time. You know, like you become a creator inherently. So as I'm, you know, looking at analytics, my husband's my producing partner at this point. 
uh, we're obviously scaling more and more uh, ad dollars and monetizing our content and whatnot, right? So everything's starting to grow and it's in our terms and we control the narrative and the image as I'm sure, you know, all creators kind of get that that dopamine uh, hit of independence. But essentially, um, I realized when I did a vulnerable, like walk and talk uh, <laughs> series, I want to call it on my YouTube, where I, I, I said crazy stuff about my life that people really just never knew. So like um, Shia LaBeouf and I don't talk anymore and he was my co-star, right? Mm -hmm. So like people would always ask me, do you know Shia? Do you still talk to Shia? And I was like, I'm going to address that. And so I was never the type of person to open my mouth. I think maybe being from where I'm from, it was very much like, be the good girl, do the right thing. Um, you're the first to go to an Ivy League school. You know, you're, you're the kid that's the golden child, essentially. So I never really thought to have an opinion about my past or, the or to unpack that stuff. But I think 2020 gave us all, and you had mentioned mental health earlier, 2020 gave us time to pause and say, okay, like mental health is okay to talk about. So that's kind of where vulnerable had its roots from because I was sick about, I was sick of talking about my shit mm. and I wanted to talk to other people about their shit. <laughs> and my husband, <laughs> and my husband was like vulnerable. That's the essence of this show. So I really have to give him his props because he's a huge creative counterpart to everything I do. I mean, I can't help it. Like you mentioned that you grew up in a home that was a little violent. It's kind of like being a little yeah. bit pregnant, you know, <laughs> um, and and obviously depends on the sensitivity of a child, you know, as I'm sure you know, as a parent, um, you know, you don't know what template, what genetic template you're getting when you give birth to this human that has combined DNA. And I always point out that, you know, what to one child might feel like not a big deal to another child might feel like a really big deal. So, um, hmm. you know, not to it's not to pass judgment or ask you to talk about things you don't want to talk about. Um, but you know, some of the words that like I use to describe my childhood are like unpredictable, you know, chaotic, like very loving and also really confusing. And, you know, um, how, how would you describe <laughs> besides a little violent, how, how would you describe, you know, kind of how you grew up and, and are you like second generation? Are you third? Has everybody been in America forever? Let's see. Yes. So my dad was 100% Italian. Um, so my grandparents immigrated from different parts of Italy. Um, and then my mom's great, she's German from Ohio, German and Swedish. <laughs> and they, they met at University of Cincinnati. And, um, you know. Hence your striking looks. That's a beautiful combination. Oh, thanks. The <laughs> cheekbones. It's just like I Italian, it German, and that. Northern European. All the things. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sweet. Thank you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, um, they came from a different time. You know, I'm the youngest of four as an elder millennial. I'm literally, my husband is, you know, 40, I'm 39 and he's, I guess, technically Gen X. So, right. Is that like, that's what comes before millennial. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But if he married a 39 year old, he kind of gets grouped in with the millennials. <laughs> I would say, right? I would say elder, but elder millennials That's right. definitely. We, we lost him. Younger He's millennials. Yours. He's all yours. <laughs> we don't own him. But the but the ref what I will say, it is very different because he's the he was the oldest, but his mom had him at 17 and mm. um he ended up in the Marines and um he had a very kind of like very hard, interesting life that I would love to chat with you about at some point. But um we we both came from pretty violent beginnings. You know, his his biological father um, was extremely violent with his mom. And I just feel like my husband and I ended up, I wouldn't say trauma bonding. I don't think that's the, the right the right thing. But I find that this is a, a lot of millennials too, by the way, like elder millennials in particular. Uh, our parents were all older and kind of had the mentality of spare the rod, spoil the child, still kind of looming in their head. The whole concept of gentle parenting was definitely like, they're disrespecting you. Gentle was, I'll warn you before I hit you. That's what's gentle about it. <laughs> <laughs> Go pick out the switch outside that you want me to hit you with. Mm. You know, like that was kind of uh, some of the earlier days. And then unfortunately, I feel like the as you get older as a child, and now I'm noticing this with some of 
the tactics that I have used in the gentle parenting approach that we're taking not working anymore and how they're getting smarter and almost, I don't want to say manipulative, but they're finding workarounds. And, um, and with my parents, I feel like they became a lot more manipulative, but, you know, enter into the displacement of a young actor's, uh, quality of life or like, Mm -hmm. like my mom left, you know, which is absolutely insane. My, I'm like, I couldn't imagine now being a parent, just leaving three of your children behind for one child's career. It's insane. My MBLX Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Jonathan, we've all had times where we've felt uncertain about where we're going in life, myself included. Sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices. The path forward isn't always clear. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or really anything, Therapy can help you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so that you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make the decisions that align with your values is like anything else. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. Jonathan and I are huge fans of therapy and we encourage you to give it a shot. If you're thinking of starting, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map. With BetterHelp, visit betterhelp.com slash break to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash break. And now a word from our sponsors at Betterment. Picture this. Your eyes meet a mysterious stranger from across the room. Your souls start to intertwine, your hearts start to become one, and you haven't thought about your investing portfolio in a while. That's because you use Betterment. Betterment lets you be wildly, madly, deeply, totally chill about your finances. Their automated technology makes it easy and simple to get in the market and stay in the market without checking in every day. Gone are the days of being glued to your phone, tracking your portfolio's every move, and not being able to trust your money is where it should be. Thanks to Betterment's expertise, automated technology, and optimization tools, you can be the totally chill investor you've always wanted to be. Plus, Jonathan, you'll have more time too. You'll have more time to figure out the mysterious and alluring stranger from across the room who will surely drive you mad. Betterment. Be invested and totally chill. Learn more at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk. Performance is not guaranteed. You know, I'm a little bit older than you. I started acting when I was 11, though. So it's kind of like you had an earlier start, you know, when I was sort of still new in the industry. But, you know, I think, and this is not a global statement about stage moms or moms who are our managers, but there's a really specific thing that happens when a child becomes the the focal point of a family, uh, either because of auditioning or success, you know, um, and what it does is it it gives that that parent who is, you know, ushering them and taking them places and going on auditions. It gives that parent a, a real identity that in many cases, I think, is very different from the identity that they may have had as simply being the wife or whatever. And I think that there's there's something really interesting because when you said she left, you know, what I thought was like, oh, she couldn't take the violence. Like, I don't know. I just made something up in my head. But that's not what you're saying. What you're saying is you became the impetus for kind of this new identity. And I think that's a lot of then what happens to us because we end up being then the recipient of holding, you know, for whatever we mean for our mom, you know? Does that sound, am I getting there? Okay. (laughs) You are 1000% there. And I say these things as I'm unpacking them, you know, I I was watching, you know, your interview, your guys' interview and recap of Jeanette Mm. McCurdy, who I recently did like a book review on because, you know, she's actually very hard to get to interview. So... (laughs) I was like, give the girl a break. She needs some time. Um, And so I'm, I'm obsessed with this process. It's a lot of what I've ended up talking about more and more and more. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what, you know, what you remember uh, that sort of made you feel like this is something I like to do or how did that happen? Because, you know, people people often ask me like what I was like as a kid. And I was, I was strange. You know, I had an odd sense of humor. I really liked mimicking. Like I liked to, 
to imitate people's voices and body language. And I love dance, um, you know, but I wasn't exceptional. Like I wasn't an exceptional dancer. You know, what I was exceptional at was like kind of standing out and being strange and funny. But, um, you know, I wonder what you were like as a kid, because Broadway kids, also kids who succeed in Broadway, it's a very, very resilient kind of personality, meaning even if it's hard and rejection, all those things, you are really, you are raised with a a veneer. Like it is shellacked on you to be presentable and to be agreeable. I mean, that's how you have that kind of success. What do you remember about yourself as a, as a wee one? You, you say a, a wonderful thing here. And also I think you were exceptional because <laughs> <laughs> that's your impact on me. Thank um, you. Poor John didn't realize. Okay. So, um, I was extremely compliant. That's mm-hmm. something that I'm finding more and more is a common thread of high performing children is that yes, they may enjoy what they're doing and they may have an aptitude at it, but that tethered to the codependency and the, the identification with your mother, mm. especially for females, right? It's like your, that's your very deep relationship there. Um, yeah, I was extremely compliant. Um, she, t- she, she says a lot of things like over the years, she ends up repeating herself a lot. I love her to death, but God, well, but she's <laughs> stuck in the past. <laughs> she's stuck in the past. And it's actually kind of a chronic problem that I would imagine a lot of stage parents have. Mm. Um, but uh, she's like, none of the other kids would do, like, would be able to do what you did. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, I was very othered to my other siblings. and. Um, you know, you have to, you have to unpack that at some point. And I'm still kind of trying to, to unpack that. Uh, but overall, I think that I did have a joy of performing and I, I'll, I always will have a joy of performing, but I do think that it can get complex mm-hmm. and not just while it's happening, but the complexity of it as you every year come to understand the fruits of your labor or uh, your, it's just, it's, it's a very complex issue. And you had, you know, kind of all these years in like really like legit productions on Broadway, <laughs> like you were kind of the real deal. Um, you, you had oh. all of these years, you know, before you sort of, you know, transformed into a, a TV presence, which I mean, in terms of like, if we, if we forget who Christy was, like the human that you were with all of your dreams and wishes and the things that, you know, if you believe in God, that God placed in your soul to, you know, have realized throughout your life. Um, what, what happened was you kind of, you ended up on this track, you know, that led to more and more success, objectively speaking, meaning the dream, you know, the dream of any kid, especially if you like grew up in New York or you're going into the city, the dream is to like get on Broadway. So like, okay, Christy did that. Like she did it really well and she did it over and over. And then the next dream is like to get to TV. Yeah. To work with Disney or Nickelodeon. Um, when did that happen? Do you remember sort of when it became like, oh, I'm not just on Broadway. Like I am now on television. For sure. Yeah. Um, basically I, I was, uh, Mary Fagan in the original parade. Mm. I was the original Mary Fagan and we were at, um, Lincoln center and live event went, bankrupt, which was the, you know, co-producer or main producer of Parade. Uh, At the time, it was really weird because I had done theater, right? And um, I had done some really indie movies. I had done a movie with Hal Hartley, who was this like edgy 90s indie, like grunge era type, like New York film guy. And, um, and then I did and like Parker Posey, right? Like that whole era. Mm-hmm. And then um, I did a Woody Allen movie. Um, everyone says, I love you. And so I was kind of this New York kid, you know, I went to this New York school with, for performing arts and I was commuting back and forth to Connecticut where I'm originally from. And it was just, I had a system in place, but then when Livent gave us money because they wouldn't extend the contract and everything went belly up, we took that money and we went out to LA because Abby Bluestone, who was my agent at the time, moved out to LA Mm. and was like, I'm at Innovative. I would like you to come for pilot season. 
And so while I was there, I had about 10 auditions. I think I stayed at the Oakwood, <laughs> uh, the, se- the cesspool of every like childhood yeah. trauma and first kiss and awkward, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I booked even Stevens from that trip. That is the show that you did with Shia LaBeouf, which you you mentioned him. And um, you proceeded to kind of become this, this very, um, very specific, very consistent, and very reliable sort of presence in this particular aspect of the industry. And when I, when I look back, you know, I mean, I remember you. And when I look back, like there was something really, you know, I hate to use this word because it was used about you, I'm sure a lot, wholesome. Like there's a real like wholesome quality to you, um, like you're and especially like as a young person, of course, like the first thing we do is like sexualize our young females. But like you were like attractive, but not uncomfortably so. But like everybody was curious, like what's she going to be like when she gets older? But you were very you were very you were very wholesome. And, you know, you you were funny. And you, you know, you you really were. You were able to convey what I think was really attractive, you know, for a lot of of what we wanted from our young comedians. Um, what do you sort of remember of that time when you think about sort of, you know, your your personal development? Like you were, a, you know, approaching kind of teenhood and this transition, you know, that you then kind of had happen in front of cameras. Yeah, of course. So awkward, right? Um, as I'm sure you can relate to. I mean, you are definitely one of my comedic inspirations subconsciously in my mind. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore mm-hmm. um, was also a huge inspiration. My mom would always end up watching her after, if when, when we were on tour, I, I watched a lot of Nick at Night. <laughs> um, so some of the yeah, some of those sensibilities for me was like, oh, big eyes, you know, um, sort of flaunt what you got. Uh, and I also was told a little bit that I was a little bit like a Wendy Malick. I think it was Hmm. Variety that said that about my, like when they reviewed even Stevens initially. And so, yeah, I mean, there was definitely a sensibility that I had that I watch. We did a couple rewatch videos, right? On YouTube. And like, actually we have a whole podcast right now called the even more Stevens podcast, Hmm. but when we, when I went back and watched the first episode, I was like, my accent is so thick. <laughs> I'm like a New York girl. And I never realized it, that I was that, you know, I was that, that was, I was a Yankee at the start of this. Mm-hmm. And um, but those sensibilities kind of came through, right? And so I was raw. And I think I had been told uh, when we first got out there, especially by Abby, who was repping me at the time, she was like, oh yeah, they like New York kids. Casting agents like New York kids because they have theater background. They hit their marks. They remember their lines. Um, <laughs> and they're com- like, they're com- AKA they're compliant, right? Mm-hmm. So um, shit. Uh, basically, I, there was a lot of awkward firsts on Even Stevens. Um, you know, I had one of my first kisses um, on, you know, on a, with a camera uh, in my face. And it was just extremely anxiety inducing. But I had to wear my first thong because I wore a lot of tight pants and like, I had to have like people tell me like, okay, this is okay. And mm. you know, it, 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 honestly, it wasn't the worst set to grow up in. Um, there was definitely a lot of different personalities. Like Shia has, was always chaotic. He was always a chaotic person. You, you both had early uh, kisses on camera and as young women, like I would imagine that's super weird. Like it was anxiety producing as a young man trying to navigate that. And I can only imagine what that would have been like for the two of you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I hadn't really thought a lot about it. I mean, I remember at the time that there was this notion of like wondering what people thought, like if people thought I had already had experience with boys and like the truth is I hadn't. And, um, that was really awkward. And I think it was more, but it it kind of felt like a continuation of the entire facade that is being an actor is like trying to convince people that you're confident about something that you may not be, whether it's a speech, you know, a word you can't pronounce, uh, uh, having to kiss someone. Um, And I think also, you know, and I don't know, Christy, maybe you have an opinion about this, like 
there's also a large technical aspect to kind of everything we do. And I don't mean to sound like when people are asked about sex scenes and they're like, it's really just technical. Like, no, it's kissing another human being. I feel that way as an adult. Yeah. Like what people will be like, what's it like to kiss Jim Parsons? I'm like, it's like kissing someone I'm not dating. Like, that's what it's like. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Yeah. Um, but when totally. I when I saw the Brooke Shields, you know, documentary, um, I I sort of started like pulling back, you know, the lens and and thinking more about gosh, when I was this, you know, young woman in a stage of life where, you know, these are all new things and that happens, you know, in our culture, I started realizing like, oh, there were all these people who also were able to observe, you know, an interaction that I was having as a human. And when I saw Brooke Shields talk about it, like it kind of freaked me out because it was completely different. You know, I was not in that situation of being, you know, literally doing content about the sexualization of a very young child, you know, what she talks about with Pretty Baby. But um, just that notion of like an entire crew and all these people and like all the things like it's just weird. And I'm not going to say that entertainment shouldn't exist where people kiss people. But I definitely think that there wasn't a notion of sensitivity about it. Christy, like what was your experience? <laughs> Absolutely not. You remember what we were talking about? It's like such a complex issue because it's like it travels with you. Like uh, John, like what you're saying, it's like those things are unpacked over time in ways that we are triggered by seeing someone like Brooke actually stand up for herself. And how old is she? Right? I mean, she's older than us, and she's unpacking this and finding her voice through making her own narrative and her own content. And it is so rewarding um, that you almost don't want to listen to the haters be like, oh, they're living in the past or, <laughs> oh, like, shut up about it already. Um, because there's a lot of value in talking about this these days. And furthermore, there is no, and there never has been, an infrastructure to support children's mental health on sets. Mm. Not truly. Not truly. I think if there was Christy, they would take us off the set and make us go back to school to learn how to be regular human beings. <laughs> <laughs> My MBA Alex Breakdown is supported by AG1. I drink AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted better gut health. This is the thing that Jonathan's been talking about. AG1 helps me get there. Also, more energy. I want a supplement also that tastes good. I drink AG1 in the morning before starting my day, and it makes me feel like I'm doing something good for my body right off the bat. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that delivers comprehensive nutrients for whole body health. It replaces your multivitamin, replaces your probiotic, and more in one simple drinkable habit. AG1 has a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients. It's raising the standard for quality in the supplement category and helps you build your health foundation first. AG1 was created in 2010, and it's helped millions of mornings begin on a healthier foundation ever since. It's not only a high-quality all-in-one solution for daily foundational nutrition, it also saves you time, confusion, and money. Why, Jonathan? Each serving costs less than $3 a day and gives you powerful, long-term results. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash breakdown. That's drinkag1.com slash breakdown. Check it out. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. Jonathan, you know that really good feeling you get when you finally find the thing you've been searching for on the internet? Big time. After spending hours researching and reading thousands of reviews, you find it. It's like the thing, whatever it is. Maybe it's sparkly disco pants, designer dog hoodies. Maybe it's the thing that literally checks all your boxes and has five stars. And maybe it also arrives in 48 hours. Well, why is it that you can get the most random, wonderfully reviewed thing from around the world in literally two days? But if you want to see a good doctor, it can take forever to get an appointment. And how do you even know if they're good? Well, there's a way. What's it called, Jonathan? It's called ZocDoc, a place to find and book great doctors who actually have amazing reviews. Many appointments are available within 24 hours. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. And we're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter 
specifically for ones who take your insurance, because why find one if they don't take your insurance? You can filter to find ones that are located near you and that treat almost any condition you're searching for. These docs all have verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. Average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just... 24 and 48 hours. You can even score same-day appointments. And once you find the doc you want, book them immediately with just a few taps. No more waiting awkwardly on hold with the receptionist. Go to ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. Download the ZocDoc app for free. Then book and find top-rated doctors today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash breakdown. ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. The Surgeon General just went live today. That's right. I saw in the New York Times, right, that that kids shouldn't... He's What did he say, guys? Because I'm not going to quote it right. Yeah, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> Surgeon General basically said, like, we don't need to keep waiting for longitudinal research about what excessive screen time and excessive use of social media in particular is doing to children. You don't need to wait for the data to come in. He said, like, don't listen to the first part of his statement, which was like, it's not entirely conclusive. But, you know, listen to the second part of his statement, which is that we absolutely know that while there are positive aspects to children feeling seen, and feeling heard and identifying with other people. And those are really positive things. Overwhelmingly, that's not what kids are using social media for. They're using it to numb out the same way adults do, except they're not just small adults. They are humans whose brains have not finished developing in the most important critical ways. I hope my children are not listening to this because they're going to be like, "Uh uh-oh, it's coming. (laughs) (laughs) I mean... You tell them this all the time at home. And I they know, don't but you know what? But I, I'm done telling them. Like, I'm done. But that's a different story. Um, Mentor me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Teach me your ways. That sounds like there's an actual boundary coming, and I really need help with that. You know what? If, you, if we want to talk about it, what the boundary is, is I have not felt confident enough in my role as a parent to say, this is no longer up for discussion. Like, that's really what it is, because the fact is, we would hope that we have a strong enough relationship with our children that we're able to reasonably speak to them and that they have an appropriate amount of both affection for us and admiration for us and respect for our role as a parent. That's the the purpose of, you know, authoritative, not authoritarian parenting. But if I am not strong enough to hold to my convictions and tolerate the pushback, and replace the time that I am relieved that they are doing something so that I can do what I want to do, which in many cases is be on my phone and answer emails. Until I am ready to do that, (laughs) nothing is going to change. Like, it literally is me. It's not their responsibility to wake up and become reasonable teenagers. They're teenagers. They need structure and they need that guidance. But until I can step into it, it's a moot conversation. There's one other point, which... You talk about, but I think is is really a huge part of this, which is the blowback or the pushback or the like, you know, when you take the drug away, <laughs> the withdrawal. The, the addict is very upset when you take their drug they're, away. They go crazy and they're so yeah. upset and then they attack and then and they're like And then you like feel like the worst parent they, ever and they say, well, you're on your phone. Right? I mean, literally, like we do this right. dance. Or they don't know what to do with themselves and they're like, I, I had this issue with my 15-year-old like, and it was, up. I tried to get him off gaming at like seven o'clock. He, he freaking melted <laughs> down. He's like, the rest of the night I'm just supposed to sit here? <laughs> I was like... It became like a really like trying to prove to him that life is worth living without this technology. <laughs> and their reactions are are so big that how do you as a parent, you know, create a space for that? Dude, my kids love these LOL dolls, which I, I originally was like, I'm never going to buy these certain kinds of dolls. But, you know, I ended up doing a sponsored thing with them. <laughs> they sent me the most beautiful dolls. I was like, they're not that bad. They're really not. And then my girls liked them. And then, gosh, darn it. We're going to Target anytime there's a special occasion to buy one of these little balls with these little dolls and all the shoes. You step on the shoes and you hurt yourself. I did want to interrelate this concept of, you know, we're we're in this, we're in, you know, 
this strike right now. We have the writer strike, we have the impending SAG strike. So much of that has to do with protections for, um, you know, streaming. And um, I will say that even sponsored content is now covered under SAG's Mm. new media contract. So you can get healthcare. So I've actually qualified (laughs) for plan one healthcare because of my sponsored content, you know? And so that's a wonderful loophole for anyone listening that's, you know, may be able to qualify for that because I took so many bad movies like that were (laughs) trashy or, you know, things I had to do just to make that, you know, minimum requirement to get healthcare over the years. And now again, one more layer of independence from, from that, uh, and just having more freedom. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is new media kids are not protected for the same reasons, um, uh, that kids in the industry in the traditional Hollywood sense mm-hmm. who are going to set without mental health infrastructure are also not. So we, we have these, this, this sort of, this very influential, like pool of talent, whether it's exclusively online or new media or in Hollywood. And then eventually they have new media mm-hmm. relationship to socials, or we have this pool of, of young people who are sick and now the Surgeon General is coming out saying that, like, this is not good. Um, and so I just think as a as an industry, it's now more than ever that I really do hope um, we can we can start connecting the dots. For sure. Um, and and I think this is kind of a loop back to to sort of, you know, part of your journey and your story. And I think that I appreciate a lot of the attention that you've chosen to give, you know, in a very vulnerable way um, to to the challenges, even when you or any of us don't look like the people that everybody talks about that are having problems. Right. Meaning it's it's clear that there are certain child stars that people always ask us about. Um, you and I both know more, I'm sure there's more than two people, but there were two Disney stars who committed suicide that you knew. Um, I, I have lost people to suicide that I used to socialize with and work with and spend time with. Um, and these were, these were kids who got lost and they were really, really not well, not given proper attention and in, in many cases, medical care. Um, but what I think is really interesting about what you've chosen to do is you came out, you know, of this period of your life relatively unscathed, meaning you had this success and you had all the complexity that many people didn't know about. Right. But you kind of you've chosen to open up about the challenges that you had, which in in some in some ways are kind of like (laughs) when I think of like the long covid phrase, it's like long celebrity stuff. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm going to lift this quote. This is the quote. You you wrote a really beautiful piece for Teen Vogue. And you said, this is the quote. I struggled with all of my relationships, alcohol usage, and career path for 10 years before going back to school and recentering myself. And I just want to like do a full stop there because that is a really, that's an enormous statement from someone who, as I said, came out really in many ways like intact and what we would think of as relatively healthy. But can you talk about what it means to struggle in all of your relationships? I know, because I know for me, and I have a feeling it's similar to you, but I want to hear what you mean by that. Oh, sure. Um, I think that coming out of the industry at a young age, um, at 18, I guess is not really a young age, but (laughs) um, uh, graduating from it, right? Uh, you end up having a very transactional outlook on interpersonal relationships. Um, You kind of are like, what am I getting from this? Or what do I have to do? How do I have to perform in order to extract what I need in this moment? Uh, And it, it, it really, it really messes you up for a long time. Um, You know, you also have to, live in your ego actively. It's, it's, I actually call it narcissistic purgatory in, I believe that article as well. Um, because it's like, you, you don't want to talk about yourself, but you have to talk about yourself. You don't want to think about the past because you want to heal from the past, but you have to talk about the past because that's all people talk about. And so it's like you're, you're one foot in one foot out or one foot grabbing you from the grave. And you're like, 
what, what can I do? I cannot win. Um, so you feel extremely vulnerable and you feel extremely exposed and everywhere you go, you feel raw and you feel like you have to be another version of yourself because that better version of yourself is going to improve, uh, the quality of your life or, you know, you don't have any answers essentially because you, you really aren't given a point of view when you're a young kid and you're, and, and they're like, this is the character you're going to play. So you, in a part of what I was reading Jeanette's book, it really, you know, I resonated with the fact that it's like, you kind of dissociate, um, over time. And, and so, yes, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, like there's a lot of my childhood that I don't even remember. Um, when I think about how I'm getting my kids to connect the dots in interpersonal relationships from step, you know, from now, uh, it's not just gentle parenting. It's me reparenting myself too. So I want them to, you know, they have body awareness. No means no. Mm. And just that alone, that body awareness keeps them in their body. If I ever know, if I ever see them get that thousand yard stare where they're dissociating because it's like an uncomfortable moment, I'm immediately like, okay, let's, let's try to take the time we can. Cause this is obviously sending this kid to a point that they can't handle this. So beautifully said. And I love this notion of staying present. Um, I wonder if we want to unpack a little bit about, you know, the mechanisms of disassociation, because we've heard it from uh, several of our guests who have similar childhood experiences, being on sets, being under an enormous amount of pressure, and what it connects uh, to people who have not been on sets. Um, the the you know, similarity there is that lots of adults and children are in these very difficult scenarios, and we learn coping mechanisms. So when you talk about how you're trying to recognize the, you know, the look in your kid's eyes to see where are they emotionally, psychologically, are they still present? Do they know how to navigate or does the pressure that they're under cause them to again, disassociate? And I'm wondering if you could like describe it a little for people who may not totally understand the concept. Well, guys, for, this is why child actors are addicts. It's because they had the high highs and they're at a low low and they're trying to find that feeling of joy. And, you know, um, you know, I remember just going out every single night towards the end before I met my husband and um, had to go back to school. Right. Like what you had said in the quote, it's like I was going out every night to voyeur and hide and I knew every, you know, promoter and every line. And I felt like a celebrity because I was next to celebrities, but I, I couldn't get call back for my agent and I couldn't ever book a job unless it was some shitty movie down in Louisiana. Like it was like I was struggling so hard with feeling seen. And I would dye my hair different colors, you know, and I would just keep paying money to psychics. And, you know, it was just stupid shit. I would sleep with different people. It was like I was just filling the void with different things. What you're describing is, I think, the experience of a lot of humans. Meaning, absolutely for us, it's like we get to talk about it because they take pictures of us. Or, you know, we we get more attention about it. Or, you know, if we wake up somewhere we shouldn't, like someone's going to know about it. Or if we, you know, <laughs> if if we're meeting someone, we have to wonder, gosh, if I go home with this person, are they going to literally post a picture about it? Like, are they going to talk about, you know, like we have to think about things on a different level. But I, I correct me if I'm wrong here. I don't know what it's like to not be who I am. But when I see what our kind of like what the accepted culture is, especially for women, what you're describing is sort of like, yeah, like what are the ways we try and get like that God-shaped hole filled, right? Like attention, mm -hmm. yeah. money, fame, sex, you know, like dudes, whatever it is, um, or alcohol, drugs, like, you know, everybody just apparently takes edibles every five minutes. <laughs> like that's just like a thing. It's, it's like, it's all like the things that we do. So I think it's really important that we get to hear the perspective of someone who clearly has thought so much about it and has sort of been immersed in this exaggerated version of what I think a lot of people's experience is. Oh, that's awesome. Well, hopefully vulnerable does that. And it's not just like, it's not just repetitive. I, I sometimes fear that. Um, I, I skirt this line of like advocacy, which I've 
never been trained in, but now I'm starting to realize that I may need to go deeper into understanding how to actually be of service Mm. Uh, and being a host of a podcast, you know, and getting the SEO, you know, sound bites and, and just to keep it going. So I, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting mix of, of how I'm handling that currently. Uh, but disassociation, I feel like is embedded in that. And of course I'm, sh- okay. So I guess there's the average disassociation that people have in their twenties where they're just like filling the God shaped hole and hopefully not getting addicted to anything right in the process. <laughs> and so many people do. And so many people, you know, settle for marriage and, you know, or go back and get their graduate degree or like whatever it is that they do. Um, but, uh, but the, 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 okay. So this is where the problem is. I think I, I knew I was living wrong. You mentioned something earlier about being wholesome hmm. and I did a lot of things with my body that I never would have done if I hadn't been a child actor. what did you do with your body? <laughs> I did a nude scene. Oh. Um, you know, I did a nude scene. It was something that I promised myself I would never do um, in, a, in a really small horror movie um, oh. that, you know, I just, again, that was one of those things where I was like, okay, like I'm brokenhearted. Um, uh, I I feel like crap. I've, you know, cut my did hair you super feel, short. Did you um, feel good doing it? No, not really. I mean, they handled it professionally. It wasn't like the production's fault. Sure. Yeah, no, no. I just, yeah, no, I just meant like interpersonally. I just felt super marked. I feel like working with Disney, I really still believe in, I've come full circle now. Um, obviously I've been sober since my first child with, from alcohol and everything else, but from alcohol mostly. Right. And it's like, I've got so much joy in my life and so much, um, autonomy that when I look back on it, I just feel so, so protective of my younger self mm. and, 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 and that somebody could have, the right person would have been there preventatively, like in the beginning part of that, so that I could have understood what my choices were. And I don't mean to be like this asshole, but I'm going to be this asshole. No, you're fine. Like <laughs> when I go, when I have gone out, to places like clubs, which I've done very rarely because it produces, I would talk about dissociation. Like that's usually what happens. And here, I'll just go ahead and drop in, you know, dissociation just so that people have a framework for it. There's, there's two kind of categories we talk about. There's depersonalization and there's derealization. And um, derealization is a very specific kind of dissociation, which I think is less common. Um, It's when you literally feel like you don't exist, like you're not a real, you're you're not really functioning in the world. Um, There's often like, um, it's it's kind of like foggy and it's weird. This will often happen when people are kind of experiencing flashbacks from trauma or like, you know, specifically sexual trauma will produce this like is anything real? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that means you've never experienced it. People who know what I'm talking about have experienced it. Depersonalization is sort of what we think about when we talk about dissociation, which is sort of like, you're numb. Like, you're there, but you're not. Um, There's a sense of, like, watching yourself. You know, like, watching a movie. Like, you can definitely feel like I'm not in my body. Um, And then perceptual alterations is something that'll happen where, like, like, you're not necessarily hearing things right. You're not seeing things right. Um, so when I've gone to clubs or honestly, this started happening the first time I was sent to teen celebrity events. When Beaches came out, I wasn't yet on Blossom. Nobody really knew who I was. Like most young people also were like, they weren't watching Beaches. Like it was people who liked Bette Midler or grownups with theater kids who love Bette Midler, right? Me. That was me. <laughs> That's still our audience. <laughs> So, you know, I would go to these teen events and it was like they would send a bunch of us celebrities. It was like me and like Corey Feldman and Corey Haim and, you know, um, and Will Wheaton would sometimes be there and like Danica McKellar and her sister Crystal and, you know, um, Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, you know, a bunch of other people. And we would go to these things and I felt completely invisible. And I don't think it's because I was dissociating. I think I was in many cases invisible. Like I didn't dress like you're supposed to dress. I wore like weird tie dye shirts and like Converse. Like I was a strange child. But anyway, um, what I remember was feeling like there, I'm going to cry now. Here it happened. Now it was like, everyone's having a good time because they were. 
And, you know, what my mom would tell me to try and make me feel better was like, they're not, ha- you know, like everybody's got a hard time. And even as an adult, people are like, you don't know what suffering people were experiencing. And so when I hear you speak, what I know is I've been to clubs and I've seen whoever you are, meaning like the you that is the Christy Romano archetype, right? I've sure. seen that girl. Sure. She's really, she's pretty, she's fun. Everybody wants to be around her or she wants to be around cool people and they're hanging out with her and they're like drinking. Everybody's like doing drugs that I don't want to do. I don't really like drinking. Like it's never been that successful for me. Um, and, And when I'm in those situations, what I see is people who are actively having a good time. When I hear you speak, what I know to be true is that you lived a life that at that time felt like the thing you're supposed to do. And of course, there's enjoyable things about it. And you get attention and it's fun to be drunk, apparently. Not for me, but for some people. But what I know to be true is also that this Christy was inside that girl. Like this person with the vulnerability, the pain, the shame, the fear, the thing, the violence, like that was all part of you. But we're taught to dress it up and just keep like laying layer upon layer of like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. So I'm saying this for two reasons, because I was right. Those people (laughs) who look like they're having a good time, they're having a good time. Like I wasn't crazy (laughs) to be like, those people have something that I don't. But what I think is really beautiful is like for you to be this vulnerable and for you to be able to have that perspective and next, I want to ask you what therapy you've been in, because I feel like you've you've done a lot of really hard work and I'm curious where it comes oh. from. But what you're able to now say is if if my daughter were supposed to go to that club, how would I want her to behave? Right. Meaning, how would I want her to feel inside so that she's making a decision that she's going to the club because she wants to? And not because it's like the thing you're supposed to have to do. And like I've interacted with and I went to college, like I went to grad school, like I spent a ton of time with people who binge drank, who did a lot of drugs. Like it's just like that's what people think you do and you hope you come out okay. And that's the thing. You just have to hope that your kids wait long enough before they do it so that while their brain's developing, maybe they won't have happened to them what you know happens to so many people. Okay, hold on one second. Christy, let's <laughs> sidebar for a minute so we can adjust Mime's worldview. <laughs> they were all having a good time. All those pretty girls, they're pretty. And people like them because they're pretty. <laughs> when you were talking, what I heard you say is that you were going out and you weren't having a good time. You you were kind of lost and trying to fill that God-shaped hole and you were being driven to appear to be having fun in a way that was actually compensating for feeling really bad. Okay. So this is going to blow your mind, but I actually identify with Maya. Like I actually never (laughs) felt like the, and this is this, yeah, this might blow your mind. I never identified. Do you want to know why? Because I never got a Maxim cover shoot. Mm. I never got asked to do certain spreads that some of my contemporaries who were on shows next to mine were doing like one in particular was there was a vanity fair spread that pretty much really helped because back in the day we didn't have social media. Right. So I'm talking about like early two thousands, um, when it was still like my space, you wanted the, you want the, you want the vanity fair Q and a, you want the vanity fair Q. I did. I still do. They've never done it. Yeah. No, I, they should. They absolutely should. And and but in a different lens. It's like the reason they were doing it was really helping set up people coming from Disney and Nickelodeon mm-hmm. to become uh, these like you know Hillary Duff and Mandy Moore and even Raven Simone. And it was like a lot of folks that were were had the right teams around them. So what it represented to me was a failure f- for my perfection. Mm. And so I couldn't ever get to the next level, which did end up with me disrobing for that movie. And, and so I just felt like, I felt like I couldn't win. I, I, I feel like I ended up becoming very comparative, uh, very whiny, very self-destructive, like all of those things. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was a brat. I was a brat for a long time and, uh, you know, binge drinking when it's not just the weekend anymore. And like, you don't have any thing to do, but you're in your twenties now. And you think to yourself, oh, if I just go out with the right people, I'll meet the right people. But like, it's just all bullshit. It really is just all bullshit. 
when you say you you relate to Maim, you relate to her experience of being at the club, her view of you as the pretty girl having a ton of fun wasn't accurate. Is that correct? Well, it, it might be accurate from her to look at me to think that, but I was thinking that of someone else. This is really interesting. Because I was a theater kid. I had buck teeth. I had no boobies. Like there was things that I was super insecure about that I carried with me after Disney. And so in my mind, I was never going to be. Right. And and I think this is this is also about levels. You know, it's about like a competition of suffering also, because, <laughs> you know, from from my perspective, you know, there there were there were places that you know, women who look like you have access that I don't, right? I just don't, like, it's just yeah. not my thing. So it's, it really is. And I think, look, this plays out, I think it starts playing out in elementary school now. It used to play out in high school, oh. you know, but I think it starts playing out, and I do blame social media for that. I think it starts playing out younger and younger where you do, you get into this, like, it's a, it is, it's not even competition. And my whole life I've been told I'm just jealous of other women. But I think it's much more nuanced than that because you just, you hit it on the head. It's not just like jealousy of like, oh, why does she have it? It's it's a sense of envy of why am I not the person that I think they deserve to see me as. Yes. Yeah. Right? Like It's community and, too. Right. Well, yeah, it's community. So in speaking from being a girl mom here in Texas, I live in Austin, Texas, My one of my daughters is super into STEM and mm -hmm. the other one is super into princesses. And like, I am going to protect my STEM daughter at all costs. Like, and, and she can still like pink or purple or whatever, you know, but like, I need to know that I advocated for her in this way and honored her true personality to, for her to be whoever she's meant to be. Mm -hmm. And the other one, if she wants to steal my makeup and my whatever's like, go ahead. We know, we know how that plays out, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, there it's, 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 it really, it does come back to the parent, like what you were saying about how the parent has the identity when we're talking about the other moms that I know and how some of those frictions I was one of the people that started the mom thread where there wasn't one really activated. And when it activated, it activated a sense of community amongst this, the women, the moms, mm -hmm. but it's deteriorated into infighting gossip. And, um, it's been really sad to see mm. because I was always hoping, you know, I went to Barnard, it's a woman's college. Yeah. It's extremely, yeah, community focused. And so for me, I've, I've always tried to recreate that because I spent my whole life being comparative and jealous and uncertain and angry. And so as a mom, I've just tried to be the change, but it does, it is, there's a lot of people that are conditioned to, to do that competitive, uh, competitive anger, or what was it? Did you say it was a competition of misery? Yeah. A suffering, a competition of suffering. Right. Love that. <laughs> First of all, going to Barnard is, it's a very big deal. Not just because it is, it's a fancy school. It's very prestigious. And Especially a really big Orthodox yeah, the, uh, well, college. We, we Jews love separating men and women. It's like one of our favorite things to do. <laughs> they find but, each other. Right. <laughs> Spoiler alert, they find each other. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> Their but parties are wild. Part of, part of the notion of separating males and females, which does happen in religious circles and specifically in, in Judaism in particular, even in our prayer space, um, is not simply misogyny. Uh, in many cases, it is utilized as a weapon against women. But the notion that women behave differently when they are around women versus when they are around men is something that every woman is very, very aware of. And, you know, for me, like my dream, my fantasy would have been to go to school with only girls because I was terrified to raise my hand because of I'm a sensitive person. And while some girls might have been like, oh, if I get it wrong, fuck the boys. I could not imagine, you know, what that would be like, especially in math and science. I don't know why that was just like a thing of mine, but it makes me so angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but but, you know, it it it's a it, it is a thing. And also, like, there's a there yeah. is a natural developmental there's a natural developmental pattern for, for most boys and girls. And of course, like gender is fluid. It's all a spectrum. I'm totally into that. Like apparently sex is fluid. Everything's fluid. But in terms of like the development of adolescent boys, there's a very specific thing that happens in our culture because we used to be in the wild not very long ago. And there were very specific roles. And now they play out, you know, in places with buildings and cars and social media. But my question was, besides like, 
the the education that you get at a place like, you know, Barnard and and that is no small thing, you know, to to go to that kind of university. Um, I am curious where your kind of psychological insight comes from, because you seem to have, you know, I, I really appreciate how much you admit that you are still figuring it out. You're still struggling and being having girls like God bless you, because like that's got to bring up so much stuff. But I'm curious where your knowledge came from. Did you get into therapy? What was that like? What's your relationship like with therapy now? Because most people don't know much about narcissism the way you do or like, you know, even the phrase you had of like, you know, being like pulled from the grave. Like there's a a, a deep awareness about issues. And I'm curious where that comes from. So, okay, let's see my relationship to therapy. I went to therapy for a while um, and I didn't take it seriously for years. And, um, you know, I think at one point somebody was like, do you want to try Lamictal, low dose, but I drank alcohol. And so it couldn't, I couldn't do that. So I never ended up successfully trying, what is it? SSRIs? Is that what SSRIs is like the classic ones. Like when people think of like Prozac okay. or Zoloft, uh, often don't work for, um, for people, you know, with, with different kinds of, um, different kinds of profiles. I, I just want to, for people who don't know, so Lamictal is actually one of these medications that was given for epilepsy and for seizures, which they realized the side effect was it had very specific mood impacts on people who often were resistant to treatment with SSRIs. So it's one of these kind of atypical, um, atypical neuroleptics. And it, it's not usually the first thing we try when someone is reporting having stuff. Um, but what what sent you to therapy in the first place? Like, and I understand you didn't take it seriously, but like, was it like, oh my gosh, I need to go? Like, when was that? Okay, so I was um, 21 and I uh, separated from my family. Uh, I did not talk to them because I was in a relationship with someone in LA. I had left Broadway, I did Beauty and the Beast. And when I left to go back to LA at 21, my mom followed me and we had a falling out. Oh. And I didn't speak to my entire family for a year. And wow. I was in a relationship. Yeah. And I was in a relationship and that relationship was extremely codependent. Mm. Um, and then um, I, I found my way to therapy and then a different therapist after that and a psychic as well. <laughs> so I'm a, I, I definitely had a love addiction as well mm. over time that, that really brought me to my knees several times. Um, I, I found my way to Al-Anon because I had some qualifiers in my life around, you know, in my immediate family and many generations of alcoholism. And I really enjoyed going to Al-Anon. Mm -hmm. um, I learned the 12 step principles over the years when I really should have been in AA. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I think that 12 step programs can be predatory. Uh, just like you were saying, certain communities can be put through predatory lenses mm. Uh, I, I think that applies with everything. And, and so with, with 12 step program, you know, uh, you gotta be weary. I mean, I was, I was assaulted by, um, someone who was in, um, Al-Anon, um, and, uh, I was drunk. So it was one of those things where I, I, I just can't go back to 12 step program where I'm at right now because I've, I've. Christy, that's enormous. Can we just like take a second? <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, any, sure. any, any assault is assault, but especially, mm -hmm. and you know, this is not typically what happens, but, um, yeah, that's forget about the Allen on part or what program, but to be on a path yeah. to recovery and have that recovery hijacked, you know, by someone taking advantage of you, that's enormous. I mean, that's a huge stumbling block. Yeah. I mean, I was, again, I was, I, the irony of that is that I was, I should have been an AA, but I, I, this predator was in Al-Anon mm -hmm. and I was drunk. So I wasn't in some ways, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a moment of clarity for me about, about like that thing I was speaking about, about having agency over your body and mm -hmm. finding your body in certain places and spaces that aren't surrounded by advocacy and, um, protections. So, that was a little bit of a wake up call for me for sure. But I still was descending into alcoholism mm -hmm. until I met my husband. And now my husband and I were together for a long time, but we still would go to bars and have fun. And my relationship to alcohol always brought me down. Um, mm. I, I just, 
I just think that getting pregnant really sobered me up. And I, I also had some really great conversations with my husband when I was pregnant. We went back to therapy together. Mm. And he said, you have to stop drinking forever. This isn't just because you're pregnant. This is something I've observed for many years wow. now. And I'm like, I, yeah, I had to, I had to come to Jesus with that. So, um, I want to, I want to just go back for, um, for a second and, um, sure. you know, what's important to point out is a lot of people, a lot of people do start in Al-Anon because they come from alcoholism where they have, um, partners or friends or family members who are alcoholics, um, they often don't realize, you know, that that's not the room for them. So this is not a, this is not a, an atypical pattern, but just for sort of, for clarity's sake, what we tend to talk about is treating the most critical addiction first, meaning um, whatever will kill you soonest, that's the program, you know, that, that usually people are kind of gently directed to. And I do have, you know, I do have friends who started, let's say in, in Al-Anon and then realized, whoops, <laughs> wrong room, went, <laughs> went to another room and then eventually came back because all those issues also need to be worked out. Meaning it's not yeah. like all of your Al-Anon issues, which for me is, you know, nagging, complaining, scolding, manipulating. Um, all of those issues still exist, even if I have a secondary addiction, which is, you know, in that case, the primary addiction. Um, I'd like to talk about, I mean, both Jonathan and my ears perked up when you talked about not talking to your family, because that's very interesting <laughs> to both of us. Oh, it was horrible. Well, it was horrible. Right. So um, that sounds like it was more a feature of the relationship you were in and not that you needed time away from your family, meaning it was manufactured by the relationship. Oh no, it was both. Basically, oh. um, my family had been, um, my mom had been sort of, you, you know, she'd been my employee for a long time, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I don't think that the money was being Got allocated it. correctly. And she knows that she knows that. And, um, unfortunately I don't, I never bought a house, uh, with the money that I mm -hmm. made and, um, I never was able to invest it properly and have sort of like a cushion Got to it. build off of. And, uh, I, 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 I can say that I've forgiven her, but it's, it's also something that's just like, it's, it's been so long now it's, it's, I've come full circle and now she lives here in Austin and I'm taking care of her again. Mm. Um, so my relationship to that dynamic has become healthier and under, and, and I understand it much better than mm -hmm. when I was expecting, you know, I, I, di I, I think this is an interesting system too. I, I, I got to a place with my mom where it was like this triangle where I said, mom, you could be my mom, my friend, or my manager, but you have to pick two. <laughs> you know what I was like? You can't be everything. And unfortunately my, she, she tried to be my manager and my mom, and then I hated her. Mm. So it, it was like, there was too much that I think I just started to resent her so much. Mm. And then, um, what happened was, is this man came into my life and was like, you don't even know how much money you have in your bank account. Um, he came from a really wealthy family and didn't even have a job, but at the same time was like, you know, you need to, you need to cut off your family. Got it. And so I had, I had gone on a cruise with my family and I had paid for it with Disney, um, letting my family be on the cruise. I got very, very sick on the cruise uh, and because I was so sick and I kind of saw them from a distance and had him chirping in my ear, I was like looking at them having a good time on my dime. And I just kind of felt like, remember I said transactional. I just, mm -hmm. I just felt really sad about it. So yeah, there was a whole year there where I just, yeah, it was really shitty. <laughs> okay. So that is clarifying. And you mentioned something that a lot of people don't talk about, a lot of people don't understand. And if there's anyone that can explain it, it's you. What does it mean to say you have love addiction? <laughs> Who? Uh, well, I mean, it goes back to being addicted to people, places, and things. Um, I was addicted to other people filling that void inside of me. Um, and uh, physically, emotionally, luckily it was not financially, because I feel like there was a couple times there when I stopped making so much residual money that I flirted with the idea of starting to date men that had money. Mm. And, um, I saw a lot of women doing it around me in the clubs and I was like, wow. So this is how people become escorts because mm. they just, yeah, they're just so far away from their purpose that even though Mayim, you think they're having that fun time, 
it's like ass cast. What is it? Ass grass, grass or cash? No one eats for free. Have you heard that? Yes, my children think it's funny to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's 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 that's what it is. If you think those people are having fun at those clubs, that's ass cash or grass. <laughs> you know, when when we talk about you know kind of love addiction, um, and and I'm a person who really really strongly identifies with sort of like. Um, being, you know, addicted to approval and validation specifically from a partner. Like it's like a thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think when some people hear that, they just be like, then just stop doing that. Like, just stop dating those people. Like, just be yourself, <laughs> like have more confidence. And, you know, I think, and people also, you know, kind of turn their nose up when you talk about, you know, there's a whole 12 step program. It's called Sex Love Addicts Anonymous. And most people think it's just like people who want to fuck all the time, but it's much more complicated than that. Um, I'm sure it is. And, I wonder if you can sort of talk about um, how how you went about sort of breaking that cycle because it's not easy. You'll basically find a different body, you know, but kind of with the same soul, you know, like is often what we do. We just like we kind of like we think we're we think we're moving up and like, oh, he's different or she's different. But it's like it's kind of when we're the one that has that sort of sickness, we'll, I'll turn anyone into my hostage. <laughs> <laughs> ass cash or grass <laughs> it's all you gotta give them <laughs> I did a lot of gift giving um I rented that individual who said that I can't talk to my family because of money I rented him a Ferrari for his birthday I I, I did a lot of expensive gift giving um and I did a lot of just really crazy and that's I think where the magical thinking comes in too what was your motive like looking back what was your motive when you were in that kind of, you know, interaction with someone? What did you want? Yeah. I just wanted I just wanted them to love me and I just wanted them to stay and I just wanted to fill the void that like, you know, my mom really made me feel perfect. And I just feel like I was looking for that perfection for someone to think that I was their perfect person again. Hmm. So, yeah, it was it was and you know what? I, I, I actually have that in my partnership and in my marriage. Um, I've managed to carve that out um, because of my sobriety, because of my commitment, because of me showing up for myself. I've made peace with, um, I've made peace with so much. Um, and actually, I, I, I'm not in active therapy and I'm not in active 12-step program. Hmm. So I, ha I feel a little imposter syndrome when you tell me that I've done all this work. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> That's, that's great. I did try EMDR mm -hmm. uh, last year and I just about had a breakdown. What what happened? What was your experience? My mom did EMDR and she's talked about it on our podcast, which is awesome. Uh, but what was your experience? Did you Were you looking at like one specific event or was it just the whole process of EMDR that was painful or hard? So we were going to start from the beginning of my relationship to, um, I think, some of the most traumatizing events and we were starting from the beginning. Mm. And so, um, you know, we did the, we did the, like yeah. the snap sounds and, um, we, you know, we, she, we did a blend too of some talk therapy. She, there's obviously a lot to yeah. unpack, um, a lot of, uh, backstory with me. So, um, not that I'm unique. I'm not trying to say I'm unique. <laughs> Thinking you're unique is one of the problems. Um, but, uh, EMDR was wild. You know, I, 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 she had told me, she goes, look, like there's all these things we need to do before we launch into practicing yeah. this. It's called preparing. <laughs> Sounds like she was doing her job. She's just trying to prepare you. It took like sessions where she was just like, I need to get your backstory to evaluate whether you're a candidate for EMDR mm -hmm. or not. And I need you to have coping skills. She gave me certain like yep. butterfly taps she gave me certain things that I would be able to do to kind of de-escalate my emotions after the treatment. Mm. Um, I am a parent of two little girls who stress me the F out, like on a, like a lot of portions of the day. I also don't sleep um, because I wake up every three or four hours with a child who's not sleep trained. So right now, it would not be in my best physical mm -hmm. advantage, I think, to try to continue on with this. Yeah. However, I want to continue to do it because it's hard and maybe I should try to, I don't know challenge myself? What do you think? <laughs> it is okay to say, I'm not ready for this kind of approach. And that's why there are so many 
different kinds of approaches to how to sort of work on ourselves. So um, I'm not giving you a hall pass. Like, I don't know what you need, but I think it's absolutely true that what's important in psychotherapy, what's important in cognitive behavioral therapy, name a kind of therapy. I mean, this happens a lot. Jonathan is a very skilled somatic worker. He's a, you know, an energy Reiki person. Um, but there are times when Jonathan has hovered his hands and has done a session with me. And I, I have to say like, no, stop. It's wrong. And so for me, like part of the growth, like part of my greatest growth often comes in when I say no to, mm -hmm. a, you know, a practitioner or when I say no to a part of growth that I don't feel ready for. Now, are there things that I believe you deserve as a human being to support, you know, getting to sort of take apart those parts of you? A hundred percent. Like it's a reality show I'll pitch as soon as I get off this, you know, podcast interview with you. Um, but I think that th what that is, is that's information that that's too much too soon without the right support that you need, right? So it's not enough to say right. everybody should do EMDR. If you've had trauma, this is what you have to do. No one knows except you. So it sounds like what was most important is you had enough growth to be like, nope, not now, right? Not now. Yes. Yes, you're right. There's power in no, especially for somebody who hasn't been able to locate that in their body in the past. Totally. So thank you for that. That even you saying that and John, you being here for that is, is very supportive. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. I like, I like definitely had a huge exhale. When yeah. You said it's okay oh, I'm, I'm glad. It. Um, okay. <laughs> we, we do have a strong interest in crystals. Jonathan and I have a collection of crystals. Oh shit. We do. We're crystal people. And I'm going to say, I know where this is headed. no, we're just, we, we have to ask you, like, there's a crystal on my desk that Danny Trejo's girlfriend told him to bring me. And I was like, yes, Danny Trejo, I will accept this crystal lovingly. And it's on my desk. But Jonathan and I have a, a collection of crystals. It's like one of the only things besides this podcast that we literally actively, enthusiastically do together. I think the crystals might be worth more than the house. <laughs> it's a small, a small <laughs> underestimation. But um, you have a so very... So they are expensive? Is that yeah. what you're selling me? Oh, yeah. They're fancy. They're very fancy. They're, they're beautiful. Okay. Not All that, right. Okay. Hold on. Not that fancy. People are going to get the wrong idea. I think we should clarify. <laughs> Number one, we don't purport that they're magical and will cast spells to change someone's existence. So right. I, I'm That's setting this up a little me. bit for you because we got a little bit of a backstory. <laughs> yes. And number two, they're not Fuck. that like you're you're making you know you made them sound a more expensive. We're not they're not like museum grade crystals. These are oh I probably know, overpaid for them. <laughs> If you got him at like Psychic Guy or something, no, I, don't I didn't. Know. You know what? There's That's... nothing wrong with Psychic Guy. I love that place. Okay, so <laughs> Christy, um, I I want yes. I actually I want you to tell the story about crystals with your mom first because you know oh it is beautiful yeah, yeah like my mom did a lot of really you know kind of like fun things and there were there were rituals that she tried to sort of introduce you know into my life and career because she knew it was hard it was hard to always be taken out of school and all your friends think you're weird and why are you leaving? And like things were weird. And I remember they promised that I could throw a little party when I got my first job after I started acting and I started acting at 11. We didn't know I'd get my first job a month later, but we did. We had like a little party. At, <laughs> of course you did. At, well, but it was like, a, it was in Pumpkinhead. It was in a horror film and whatever. But we had like a little party at Fairfax High School, like literally just like a bunch of my friends and like my dad did like sports Hi. games and it was fun and whatever. But um, there's something that your mom did that was sort of like a little bit of a, a ritual that then ties to a crystal story you have when you're older. Okay. So <clears throat> I commuted from Connecticut, um, a little town called Milford. It's like a very like fun little, you know, uh, it's on the sound. Um, and it's a very Italian American middle class, upper middle class, whatever, mostly middle class, like place. I, I love my little hometown. I, I wish I could go back um, more often. Um, but commuting every day was a tremendous amount of work. It was an hour and a half each way. And then I would go to school <clears throat> and then after school, which was in on 60th and 10th, I would go to Broadway dance center, or I would have to be taken out of school to go to auditions. Like, you know, I would pound the pavement from the time I was, I mean, I started at six and a half. I was on my first national tour, back to back tours, uh, 
which displaced me from my family for years. And then came back and started really going into New York when I was like, I want to say like uh, first or second grade. Um, no, I'm sorry. That would make me, yeah, maybe it was like second or third grade actually. So <clears throat> I, I've, I've commuted a long time <laughs> across, across from one of the entrances of times of, uh, what is it? Uh, Grand Central. There was this place called it was called Times Square or something. It's almost like, uh, you remember like in the movie Big where he sees like, what is his name? Voltar or whatever. Like uh-huh. that's the, yep. the, it was like that for me because it was on the corner and it was like shiny. And it kind of even reminded me of the movie um, Never Ending Story with the Flatiron Building. Yeah. And it was just this beautiful little shop that had all these crystals that decorated the 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 window shops. And I would have to walk by there from whatever train stop we got out of to get into, to get, catch our train. And my mom, I don't know, I want to ask her since she does live here as to why or what the first crystal was, because I'm almost too young to remember, but I have this collection of like little vanity crystals. So like those little tiny ones that are like a bear and like a piano, a piece of cake on a glass plate that you could fit in your hand, like little collectibles that that were very precious and represented, you know, a lot of money for me to get. And so it was a reward system that my mom kind of designed for me to feel validated for all of this effort that I was making at a very young age. And, you know, I, I, it was mostly when I booked something, right. Um, it was, so I, I, I don't, I wish I would have been even better at labeling, which, you know, job I got for each one of them. Uh, but I still have them. That's the irony is that I I have them and it's a bit triggering that I still have them, uh, but I have them. So cut to that relationship I talked about. Actually, it was before that relationship. Oh God. I was in New York City. <laughs> I was doing Beauty and the Beast. It, there was two psychics. Wait, so that, how old were you at over. this time? I was 19 and I was, uh, I, was do, I was starring on Broadway, eight shows a week. I was very tired. Uh, I had, you know... Uh, open throat surgery prior to doing Mm. bell. And so my voice was very stressed out and I was burnt out, really burnt out. Uh, and, uh, I had a psychic approach me at the stage door. Cause I, I basically signed for like everyone I possibly could, um, every kid, uh, outside of the stage door every night. Because you would never, you would, you, sorry, I just want to interrupt real quick because I feel you, you would never say (laughs) with the schedule that I have, I just had surgery the one gift I can give myself is to be able to turn off that light in my brain and my eyes so that I can as quickly and swiftly as possible know that I've done my job and now it's time to rest. Yeah, that wasn't an option though, right? (laughs) It was like, it was like, (laughs) so this is why when I see these girls, you know, the Zendayas and the Selena Gomez's and I see even the younger ones and I see them, you know, from afar, I'm like, I don't think I would want that kind of notoriety. And, and so when sometimes people throw up in your face, like, oh, she's her, her ship has sailed and all the like stupid, hateful, ignorant comments that people make, what they're not seeing is that I'm in control of so much of everything that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas before it was, my body was not my own, right? Mm -hmm. Like I had to do everything for some, some greater purpose, essentially. It was very sacrificial in my mind. So I didn't have any answers. This lady approaches me, which they're not, John, maybe you know this, but psychics are not meant to approach you. That's usually a red flag. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the psychic protocol is, but definitely <laughs> someone who is uh, actively recruiting is, is sus- suspect. And so I, I called her up and, I, and she goes, I, I have answers for you. You know, you, sh- you had a love that, that, you know, broke my heart in college the year mm-hmm. prior. And so she just basically started doing work with me where she would do strange candles and she would have me buy things. And, um, I would drive from my, my, it was like not hell's kitchen, but basically drive over to Weehawken where, she, where her house was. Mm-hmm. And I had this relationship with the psychic for like months and I started dumping more and more money into the products that she said that I needed to have and that I was damned and that there was a curse on my family and, um, that it was, it existed before me and there, I had, you know, someone else was going to have the career that I wanted and the guy that I wanted and all this stuff. And I needed, eventually it culminated probably towards the end of my tenure as Belle, which I didn't even think about 
uh, it was like, okay, we got to, we got to get as much money from this, this John as possible. Mm -hmm. So she needs to buy this crystal. So she told me about the crystal and, um, I had been so addicted to her, um, like, like, uh, her sense of community that she gave me and the answers that I thought that I was getting, um, that, uh, yeah, that was kind of, that was kind of where I reached a limit. And I was like, sure. What do you need? Mm. Uh, she's like, I need like 20 or $30,000 for this one crystal. And so at that time, this was prior to me leaving my family for that year, you know, about money and stuff. And, um, I'd never made large purchases. I was very, probably pretty frugal by most teen star standards. And so I had my, I had, I think I just made the, I made the extraction or something without my parents knowing. And then I think like within like 48 hours, I realized what I had done was wrong. Mm. And I had mm. reached this strange breaking point where I called my mom and dad and I, I was like, dad, I've been, I've been uh, bamboozled or something. So I don't know. It was like a moment of clarity for myself. And yeah, I, I want to, like <laughs> I want to highlight this, not because I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't have judgment, you know, about this path that you went on at all. And I know a lot of people hearing this might think like, oh my God, that sounds crazy. I would never let that happen to me. But I totally get it. And I also think that, you know, again, it's not a comfortable thing for, for you to talk about, but you know, as with all other things that we've spoken about, like I give you so much credit for like having enough awareness about yourself and what feels right to you to be able to say like, this is what happened and why, because it's not dissimilar to me from thinking of you in those clubs when you're dyeing okay. your hair <laughs> and you're standing next to the person <laughs> and you're like drinking and you're doing the thing and you're sure. sleeping with this person or whatever you're doing. Because it's mm -hmm. kind of like it's when we're on that spectrum of what do I need to do to feel okay, to feel like I can make sense of a world that doesn't, to feel like there is a path for me that so, just give me the answer, right? Like it makes sense to me. That's exactly what I told her. I think that's what I said. I just want answers. I, I, yeah, you've, de you've hit it on the head. That was what I wanted. I never got them and I never got the crystal. <laughs> I never got the crystal. Guys. What? That's so sad. I know that's the sad part. Like, and, and my codependency <laughs> is like, I'm like, find me a $30,000 crystal and send it oh, no. <laughs> to Christy Romano. Stat. Oh my God. I love that. That's really sweet of you. <laughs> She's expecting it now though. <laughs> I am half, half, I'm half expecting it. <laughs> As we sort of wrap up our time with you, what, and this is like a really weird question that I've never asked anyone in the whole time we've been podcasting. What do you know to be true? What do you know to be true about you, about your path, about your existence? What do you know to be true? That there is light and that there is dark. That is what I know is to be true. And that there are light actions and there are dark actions. And the light will result in more light. And the dark will result in more dark. There's a mic drop. <laughs> it's, been, it's been such a pleasure. Well, you've never asked that question. So no, I, I, I didn't answer. know. That was an answer worthy of a we'll question never I've never asked. We'll never ask it again. That and was no one the can ever answer. answer that better than Christy did. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Yeah, I just we we really appreciate, you know, um you and you being so open and talking about all the things and um really hope people will check out your podcast Vulnerable. What else should people know about you? Where would you like to direct them to learn more about the incredible stuff that you do? Podco is the podcast company that my husband and I just launched and we just had a business insider article about our company. Hmm. So we took it upon ourselves to kind of make our own content, but then we webbed out. And so we have like Joey Lawrence, mm -hmm. the Lawrence brother podcast, the Fun. brother we love that's, we produce that. And, um, we have uh, a wizards of Waverly pod rewatch a, uh, which we had Selena Gomez on already. Uh, and we have, um, let's see, uh, Ned's declassified, which was a really popular Nickelodeon show. Uh, and vulnerable and, and the even more Steven. So we're growing as a company. So I'm taking all of the knowledge of empowerment 
that my husband and I have sort of accrued into understanding the algorithm and marketing and, and we're spreading that to people that, that wouldn't otherwise do it for themselves. And I think that that's, what's really great about Podco is that it's kind of that wholesomeness that you were talking about. It's, it's what we're finding is the connectivity of, of trying to produce content f- for other people to become empowered. That's incredible. It makes total sense. And we just, we're so appreciative. And thank you so much for coming and breaking everything down with us. Yeah, I'm on TikTok. I'm on YouTube. I'm on all the things. And yeah, come find me, come play. Are you under under your name? Is that your handle is your name? Yeah, on TikTok, yes. And it's the Christy Carlson Romano on Instagram. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I I mean, I'm so grateful that she shared so openly. I want to check out her podcast, but I just want to I I want to launch a podcast with her podcast company all about her. It's a great conversation and now we have an excuse to go to Austin, Texas. <laughs> I have a new best friend. All right, from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two on fiction. And now she's going to break down 